For Krima Media's Polity, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Associate Professor of Media Studies at Vet University, Nikki Falkov, to discuss a book titled Warrior State, Risk, Anxiety, and Moral Panic in South Africa. So, Professor, your introduction made me panic because we as South Africans are used to living under fear. Tell us what you were told about the country upon your arrival. Is that the reason why you wrote this book titled Warrior State, Risk, Anxiety and Moral Panic? I lived outside South Africa for, I don't even remember now, 12, 14 years. It was quite a while. Um, and I didn't do that thing that a lot of white people do where they kind of, they run away because they're afraid. You know, I left in 2000, which was a point where South Africa was actually very optimistic. Things were feeling great. Everyone was super happy. You know, I didn't leave because I was like, well, oh, this country is falling apart. I left because I was very excited about going and running around the rest of the world. And I had, you know, big ideas of living all over the place. Ended up living in England, which really wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> but, you know, life happens. I finished my PhD in the UK, moved back to South Africa because I got a postdoc at the University of Johannesburg. I didn't think I was going to stay. And I did because I fell back in love with Joburg in a way I hadn't been for a really long time because it had turned into this incredible city. But one of the really interesting things for me about coming back was having everyone in my life ask me if I'd lost my mind. People were going, well, why, why would you move here? Why would you live here? Why would you want to be here when you could be in England where it's safe and it's organized and everything's normal? It's like the UK is not, I mean, we're seeing this very clearly with what's going on in their politics right now. The UK is crazy in its own way, right? South Africa is not the only place that is riddled with fear and anxiety and inequality and political nonsense and corruption. We find these things all over the place. But for some reason, mm. South Africans particularly middle-class South Africans, particularly white middle-class South Africans, I think that we have a monopoly on anxiety. We think we live in the most terrifying, most frightening, most dangerous, most worrying place. So I moved back here and people kept asking me if I was crazy for coming back. And then when I tried to explain how much I loved Joburg, you know, it's this pumping, thrilling city. People were like, well, you got to be careful not to drive and be careful of the taxis and be careful that you need medical aid and you need this kind of insurance and you need that kind of security and you can't live somewhere that doesn't have armed response. And all of this information, you know, it wasn't as though... When you move to a new city, the information you get from people is this is where to get the best food. And this is mm. where you'll hear the most amazing live music. And this is the best part. Yeah. And Joburg people yeah. tell you what security provider to call. So it really yeah. struck me straight away that, you know, we live in this city that is beautiful. It is vast. If you are fortunate enough to be in the middle classes, you probably live in a really nice home or apartment. You probably have someone else cleaning up for you. Your kids probably go to a really nice school if you have kids. And yet you feel like you have this terrible, terrifying life. So that was kind of the nub that got me thinking about this stuff. What is it about anxiety? What is it about fear and anxiety that define our lives in South Africa in such particular ways, which then led me on to thinking, what if fear and anxiety, what, what may they feel like for people who are not like me, who do not have a car and a house mm -hmm. and an armed response company? You know, how do these persistent, powerful, negative emotions manifest for people across the spectrum in South Africa? And what can we learn by looking at emotion as a political force, because of fear, negative emotions really structure so much of our politics in this country. You also say that uh, living in a state of risk, uh, whether actual or imagined, has emotional consequences. What does that mean? So there's a lot of powerful academic literature on, on what people call fear of crime. And a lot of the work that people have done around this area shows that Crime, obviously, is very detrimental to people's daily lives. Being a victim of crime is very detrimental to people's daily lives, of course. But so is being afraid of crime, right? Living your life in a sense of permanent anxiety that something violent or terrible is about to happen to you, that you are going to be harmed, that the people you love are at risk, that the things you have worked really hard for are going to be taken away from you, that you are in some way or another a target, really, mm. really impacts on the way in which we live our lives. And mm. this kind of processes of fear of crime, again, you know, the academic literature and mass media conversations often focus largely on the middle classes because we are loud we have the loudest voices our fears are very yeah. visible and very audible and you know people know that we need to be protected but if you look at the stats that we have you know the people who suffer the most from actual crime tend to be working class or poor and black 
Mm. And the people who suffer the most from fear of crime, the people who talk about crime the most, the people who live in a state of persistent anxiety tend to be poorer, working class and black in this country. So there's something very, very significant about how we think about the risks that we face. You know, what does it mean to be permanently at risk when you are permanently at risk, but in a very, very different way to somebody else, right? Okay. How does my yeah. risk processing as a white woman who faces all of the drama and the trauma of being female in South Africa, but knowing that as a white woman and a white woman who lives in the suburbs with the house and the car and the armed response, I am significantly less at risk of GBV than say my young black female students who live mm. in Bramfontein or commute to Vitz from Soweto. You know, the stuff that those young women have to put up with from community harassment to the kind of daily harassment that you get taking taxis across Johannesburg, that is not the same as my experience. So my anxiety about being female here, as deep as it is, mm. is not the same as theirs. And we need to acknowledge how proximity to power really, really, really impacts on how people feel. And that, of course, impacts on how they live and how they move through the city, which impacts on how the city works, you know. And that there are a lot, there are big knock-on effects of this stuff. Our economies are impacted by the way in which we feel. And yet we constantly dismiss emotions as these unimportant things. When you address a uh, white genocide in the country, that was highlighted by the Red October campaign. You say that murders of white people on farms are not proof of genocide. And that there is no credible evidence uh, that has emerged to show that farm attackers are military trained. Tell us about that. So what I tried to do in the chapter about white genocide, which was the hardest chapter to write, because I had to engage with some deeply, deeply unpleasant material while writing this. You know, no one likes to deep dive into the world of the far right. It's not a, it's not a nice place to be. And what kept coming up was this kind of dissonance between real deaths and the, the genocide myth. There are mm. there are real people. There are farmers, there are white people, older people, often elderly people who are being killed on farms in extraordinarily brutal ways. And it is horrific mm. and it should not be allowed to happen. But there are elderly black people who are also being killed on farms and in rural areas in horrifically brutal ways. As I just suggested, there are women across the country being attacked, harmed and killed in horrifically brutal ways. We all know the story of Uyenene. We all know the story of Anin. Mm. We all know the story of Riva, every other spectacular case. But yet somehow what the far right in this country has done is they have weaponized the deaths of their own people to make a political argument, right? It's mm. so cynical. They have weaponized the deaths of white Afrikaners on farms to say, no, 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 those deaths are not like the other violent deaths that happen to literally everyone else in this country all the time that should not be happening. Yeah. Those yeah. deaths are a genocide, which means what we need is we need the global community to come in and censure the ANC and make sure no one takes our land away. It's this really cynical exercise in which real bodies, real deaths, real traumas, real disasters and real tragedies become utilized as part of a political discourse that aims at retaining white people's power and access to land. And there are a lot of people mm. who believe these myths of white genocide. But, you know, even if we look at the stats, even if we look at the numbers, right, and obviously the white population in this country is much smaller than any other racialized group's populations. But statistically, mm. the numbers of white people who are murdered here Percentage of white people who are murdered in South Africa is way, way, way lower than the percentage of anyone else who is murdered. Yeah, if there was an anti-white genocide, there would be a larger percentage of white people being killed. This is not the kind of work I do because I'm a media scholar, but wonderful organizations like Africa Check have done incredible work mm. in debunking all the statistics that sure. these far-right groups like to throw around. We know that it's not true that mm. whites are being killed in their droves. But what you see when you look at the discourse is that people like Steve Hofmeier mm -hmm. and Ernst Rutz, at least at the point where I was looking at this information, they start to equate genocide with things like losing land and losing mm. language and you know of schools not teaching in Afrikaans and names being changed. So this huge, important, major idea of genocide, which, which became adopted by the United Nations in order to mm -hmm. stop very marginalized mm -hmm 
communities being murdered en masse, it gets used to say, oh, well, we're no longer socially dominant or culturally dominant, therefore we're being wiped out. And it's it's not the same thing, you know? Like white people in this country may face violence, but we also have the right to vote, make up most of the percentage of CEOs in South Africa still. We own media houses. How are we a tiny oppressed minority experiencing genocide? It makes no sense. Okay, uh, for those who will be wanting to read the book, I know that you also discuss a lot about uh, drugs and uh, related issues that goes with drugs in our country. But uh, you also highlight the issue of Melville. Most of South Africans have termed Cape Town as its own country. But when I read the book, it also came across as if Melville is also a country on its own because you are discussing how Melville now is using modern technology to deal with social ills like crime and fear. Is that not in a way a professor exacerbating structural issues like inequality in our country? Yes, yes. absolutely. I think it is totally exacerbating our structural issues. I mean, Melville is such an interesting neighborhood because, you know, like I say in the book, it's kind of, it does the same thing that other white suburbs do, but it also has this kind of bohemian character and it likes to think of itself as very liberal. All of which is becoming particularly complicated at the moment because at the moment crime in this neighborhood is so high that there is a serious plan being floated to boom off the entire neighborhood. Not the bit I'm in. I'm outside the boom. So I'm like (laughs) the cousins next door. But the Melville Residents Association is talking about working with the city to actually turn it into what they call a security suburb, a closed neighborhood. So other people can come and visit, but it's only really available to those who are wealthy enough to own or rent houses within a specific demographic. And the way that this is being sold is very interesting because, you know, people are talking about all about security and safety and being able to walk the streets and enjoy the little village. And it's being framed in a way in which it's like, this is such a wonderful, unique little country of its own. We must protect it. And of course there is a reality to crime rates in Johannesburg right now that is hugely, hugely disturbing, but there's also something else going on here, right? What is it that we are trying to protect by booming off this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Who exactly are we? And if we all agree to shut all these roads off, what are we saying to everyone else? We're saying we own this space because you don't deserve to be here. You are not part of our community. So even the kind of faux liberalism that you find in a lot of middle-class white communities disintegrates when faced with crime, when faced with fear, when faced with anxiety. So there are these ways in which a lot of white South Africans kind of perform liberalism. They perform this idea that they're kind of lefty and they believe in social justice and they're not racist and all these things. But as soon as they get told there's crime, it's almost like crime and fear give you a reason, they give you a way out of having to perform that kind of liberalism. You can suddenly go, look, it's not about how I feel anymore. It's about the facts. And I need my children to be safe. I don't have a choice. I need to protect my family, which means I need to keep you and you and you and you and you out. So the neighborhood character of this neighborhood actually does, I think, contribute to systemic problems of injustice, even while it kind of papers over them by going, oh, look, we're so diverse. There's so many students here. Isn't it great? We love it. You know, it's not Dane Fern. What else do you discuss in this book uh, without giving away too much? So you can expect to end up very depressed. (laughs) <laughs> I recently had some feedback from my postgrad students and they said to me, look, it's all very interesting, but can you stop being so depressing, please? The work that I do can be quite bleak. There are no easy answers. You know, you mentioned the issue of drugs and panics around drugs. And of course, this is a global problem that our way of dealing with problems of addiction, which are very often also problems of poverty and hopelessness, is to demonize people and expel them from society. And we know we have decades of data showing that that's not helpful and it doesn't work. And throwing people in prison for drug offenses doesn't work. And yeah, kicking people out of polite society, out of functional society for drug offenses doesn't work. We have to find other ways. But yet, you know, I think inspired by the US's longstanding war on drugs, we are also terrified of what drugs mean that the narratives and the mythologies around drug use and abuse in our communities just become so overblown that as well as the problems of crime and addiction and other forms of antisocial behavior, we also have all this demonization going on that makes it very difficult for us to respond to drug problems with anything approaching empathy. And these kinds of problems are not going to go away. They are going to keep 
coming. They're going to keep approaching us, particularly because inequality in this country is just deepening. And, you know, we can say the same about problems of alcoholism. One of the reasons for our epidemic of GBV, our epidemic of femicide that keeps getting brought up is, you know, too much alcohol, people shouldn't drink. And we saw this under COVID with the mm. lockdowns where alcohol was banned mm. and there was far less violence in the streets. But then we found out later that violence in homes had spiked yeah. because alcohol may be, yeah. you know, one of the kind of symptoms of the social disaffection that we suffer from, of the, the hopelessness that South Africans are suffering from. But it's not the cause. Mm. And I think one of the things that this book is trying to do, that a lot of people are trying to do at the moment, is to push the government, to push civil society, to push academia, to push you know people in daily life, to think about the causes. Why are we in this mess? It's not as simple as going, oh, these people are just like that, or these people are just like that, or it's just about corruption, or it's just the ANC is corrupt. Boom, there's a single word answer to all of our problems. That's not the case. And one of the things that I think we need to do in order to understand where we are better is to understand the role of emotion as a social and political force in the life of South Africa, how that has been manipulated by politicians for such a very, very long time from the NP telling whites that if they don't keep voting NP, then they will get murdered in their bed by the nanny to Operation Dudula telling men that they've got to go and you know burn down Malawi and Spaza shops, otherwise they'll never get a wife right? These persistent negative emotions yeah. have been incredibly yeah. useful for politicians in South Africa, and it's time for us to start thinking about what they might mean as well. There was Professor Nikki Falkov in conversation with Polity to discuss her book titled Warrior State, Risk, Anxiety, and Moral Panic in South Africa.